Barca, this elderly Pomeranian that Ash and Daniel are trying to save, is Chewbarka gonna be okay? Chewbarka makes it through the book and is alive at the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have needed that spoiler so bad as a kid when I was reading books where the dog died all the time. And I just got like to the point where I was like, I'm not even gonna read books with dogs in them anymore because I know what's gonna happen. It's not cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody, you can rest easy. This is a great book. And Chewbarka, Chewbarka will have a happy ending. So yes. awesome. Okay. So Jules, could you kind of start off by giving us an elevator pitch for Both Can Be True? Yes, I would be happy to do that. Um, Both Can Be True is about two kids. We have gender fluid Ash and emotionally sensitive Daniel. Uh, they team up to save this elderly Pomeranian named Chewbarka from being euthanized. Um, together, they try lots of different avenues to keep the dog alive and hidden until an adult at the kennel where Daniel volunteers can get back to town and help out and take the dog. Um, so as the story goes on, they kind of start catching feels for each other, um, but Daniel thinks Ash is all girls, so things get really complicated right when it seems like relief might be in sight. And uh, then it's very tense and exciting until the end. So <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, where do Ash and Daniel and Chewbarka come from? Um, so Daniel comes from, um, I've always had like very outsized emotions my entire life and I've gotten a lot of messages that, whoa, you are too much. So I've always kind of struggled to rein it in. Oh, wow. Um, and I think that tends to be harder for boys than for girls. Um, so I want to do like have Daniel as a boy experience this to kind of like highlight how patriarchy gives this message that emotions are female and therefore bad. Um, so that's kind of where Daniel comes from. Um, Ash comes from my own struggles with like gender identity and figuring out like where I am on the spectrum. Um, I kind of went through a lot of the same mental gymnastics that Ash goes through in the book trying to like figure it all out. Um, for me, it's been like spread over decades. For Ash, they kind of figure it out by the time they're 13. So good job, Ash, you're a little ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, and Chewbarka actually comes from, so when I was in high school, um, like Daniel, I worked at a veterinary hospital that had a kennel in it. Um, and I was in charge of like cleaning up after like after hours. So like after the dogs went home after surgeries, I would clean out the cages and kind of like prep things for the next day. And one day there was this dog there who was like kind of in a little cage off by herself. And she was mm. there. She was going to be euthanized the next morning. And um, she was there overnight. If I remember right, it was because there was like a family member out of town who needed to like get back in town to say goodbye to this dog before they euthanized it. So I was like there alone at night with this dog that I knew was going to be killed the next day. And I'm like, I can't do anything because if I took it, they would know it was me. And, you know, like I, I didn't have anywhere to put it. I was a teenager living at home with my parents. They would have lost their noodle if I brought a, you know, decrepit dog home. <laughs> so yeah. I couldn't do anything about it. So I was like, I could not save the real dog, but I could save Chewbarka. So Chewbarka makes it through the book. Good job, Chewbarka. <laughs> oh my gosh. I had no idea that was such a personal story. Like, um... Yeah, that, that's been knocking around in my head since high school. And so I'm glad I finally got to like write about it in a book. <laughs> was it was it therapeutic at all for you to kind of it was. give the dog that ending? Yeah, it, I mean, it was it was great to like save Chewbarka. Um, but like, I, I know, you know, it was too late for that dog. So that's always just kind of been like a little sad thing that happened, but you know. Yeah, well, and you also, I know, are, are have so much of a connection with animals anyway. You have dogs at home like and- a lot of dogs and some pythons and a bearded dragon and a billion cicadas. <laughs> yeah, right. I, yeah. I, I, in Cincinnati, everybody, we are uh, yes. cicada central right now. We're having yes. fun. It's a blast. <laughs> Brudex. Ugh. All right. So um, probably this is a, 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 a an obvious question, but is there a character that you identify with more, um, Daniel or Ash? Um. It's kind of a split because there's just like so many different pieces of me, just like there are so many different pieces of other people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would risk like 50% really. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of everything. Bit of yeah, yeah. They're they're all pieces of me, which is interesting because they're very different from one another. So, you know, we all have these like contradictory parts of our personality. So it's interesting to like split that up in a book and write about it and see it on the page. You're like, oh, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of authors have that experience where like they put a piece of themselves into their characters and then they wind up with two very different characters. And then, you know, they're like, these are both me, but 
how can that be? I don't know. Humans are weird. <laughs> but it, but it's also interesting because they also end up not being you and they end up being themselves yeah. in such yeah, a weird yeah, yeah. way. Because they really take on their own life. Yeah. And it's funny when people read your book, sometimes they say, oh, well, that character's obviously you. That, that character's obviously so-and-so. And you're like, well, no, they all just no, kind no. Of started doing <laughs> their own thing and they're their own people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That is a weird feeling. It is. So um, I'm going to refer to my notes. If everybody, you see me looking down, I'm just making sure I stay on track. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about this before, but I was going to ask you to dig a little deeper about why it, you felt like it was important to feature a boy who experiences really intense emotions. Yeah. Um, it's like in our, in our patriarchal society, like I was talking about before, um, emotions are really associated with femininity and femininity is frequently devalued not you know sometimes it's blatant but a lot of times it's not blatant just in terms of like opportunities that are given to boys versus opportunities that are given to girls that's starting to change which is awesome there's all these like stem camps for girls now which is terrific um so i just really wanted to like kind of shine a light for for kids who might not you know they're kind of middle grade kids are at this point where they're just like really starting to like wake up to the larger culture and to where they might fit into it so i wanted to kind of show them via these characters the ways patriarchy can be damaging and can try to like punish boys for feeling too much more than they might punish girls for feeling too much mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and showing at the same time that like we all experience intense emotions from time to time and devaluing that and like saying that that's a, you know, not a good experience and it's a problem for others. No, that's not good. We can't do that. We need to like value our emotions and like learn, learn from them, learn what they teach us. And I think that's harder for boys because they feel bad about their own emotionality. So they kind of try to push it away and it can be harder for them to like learn the lessons that might be easier for girls to learn because they've been taught you know that it's more okay for them to feel these strong emotions so there's there's just a lot of societal messages about gender that like made their way into this book that i'm hoping yes. kids will kind of see and start to think about these things in like the larger context of their lives and what the rest of their lives might be like right so, right yeah. well that actually leads me um to a question i had later but I'll, I'll ask it now because um i read an early version of this book and loved it and um one of my pieces of feedback was just that you will have readers who are kind of on all sorts of places in their journey and all sorts of areas on the spectrum of gender identity. And for the ones who are more kind of cis or who are maybe not questioning the way Ash is, uh, I, I thought it'd be great if you could help them understand a little more about what it's like for mm -hmm. Ash to kind of go back and forth between boy, girl, and um, in keeping with what you were just talking about, about society um i really liked how you did this and especially um because you you were assigning a gender to like a lot of different things like music clothes shower products like even a kitchen faucet <laughs> there is literally a scene where ash gender the kitchen faucet <laughs> yes yes and it's like american culture does gender a lot of things and so i just wanted you to talk about why you wanted to explore that in the book um, well, I think we've all had the experience where we go to a store, particularly a store for kids, and we see just like ridiculously gendered products. Like yeah. you'll have like two pairs of ice skates that are built exactly the same. You got the pink one called the little angel and you got the blue one called the little champ, you know, or you've got like two sets of dress up kits where it's just like a, a like a lab coat and the pink one says, you know, be a beautician and the white one says be a doctor and it's very clear which gender these products are marketed to. Um, it's so often like the, the girl product is shown to be lesser, like it might be smaller or it might cost more for no reason, or it'd be like painted bright pink. Um, and so this really starts to give kids these like explicit messages about what's okay to do for which gender. Um, it's nonsense. It makes me bananas. Um, so like it, it even happens from birth, you know, like you'll have like baby wipes that come in pink packages versus blue packages and they're the exact same thing. Um, there is right. zero need to do this. It can be so damaging when messages about what gender can do what channel, you know, into kids brains and they start like thinking, you know, I can't do this because I'm this gender. Or I can't do that because I'm that gender. Um, I, I wanted to kind of like get readers thinking about like just how ridiculous all of this it is and start to like question that and to think critically about that. And so 
that's, that's kind of one of the big things I hope to impart in the book. So hopefully it came through. <laughs> yeah, I think it absolutely did. And another thing that is kind of important is I think also how you talk about Chewbacca, because Chewbacca is kind of old and leaky and smelly. Chewbacca's, you know, we love Chewbacca, but <laughs> you could have made Chewbacca this cute little puppy and you didn't. And so that's, that was interesting. Like, talk about why you did that. Um, I think really often, kind of especially when the pandemic started, um, people's re like um, relationships with pets is pretty transactional. Like, you know, you want you want a cute puppy because they're they're fluffy and they do silly things, and you can like post great videos of them to Instagram being hilarious and adorable. And so, like humans get kind of this serotonin boost from watching them and interacting with them and playing with them. Um, so, but for people like Daniel and like me, um, we're super empathetic and we kind of take on the feelings of those around us. So when we see these just like decrepit falling apart dogs who like their tongue doesn't stay in their mouth and they pee when they bark and they, they smell bad and their breath is fishy and like, you know, those are the animals that are just gonna get completely left behind. And so um, like for empathetic people, your heart can just like really go out to those dogs. And so when you take care of a dog like that, or when you like rescue or foster or, or do something good for that dog, um, that relationship moves from like less transactional serotonin boost to like a much more deeper and meaningful kind of relationship. Um, and like, I think those dogs tend to like, to know that they're, they're being rescued by a human. And so they have this like gratefulness. And then the human feels like they're doing something like meaningful for this dog. And so that transaction moves away from like cute to serotonin to like deeper and meaningful and you know a relationship that's going to stick with you like long after you're not you know the dog dies or you, you whatever happens you know yeah. so I, I wanted to kind of like call out the value that dilapidated falling apart pets have too it's not just the cute ones that are great you know because all of them they're all great we gotta say they are <laughs> well, and you and you do work with with a special needs dogs. Um, yeah, I, I, you give a lot of your love and time and energy to, and and I won't spoil it. But one of Jules's dogs will make an appearance, a cameo. No, actually, three, three, three of them. Three of them did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I only knew yeah. the one. So all yeah. of them got in. Yeah, Sally was there, and Polly the Chihuahua, and Big Dave was like he had a, he had a sort of different appearance in the book than he does in real life, but the name big dave is in there a dog named big dave he's a pit bull so <laughs> okay so so um ash's dog what was ash's dog chunk chunk booper booper the beagle booper booper the yeah. beagle that's not Booper's one of your dogs completely made up yeah oh uh, okay completely. No, yeah the, the the other the um the rescue dogs make an appearance at the very end of the book so oh okay so booper is not necessarily based on a real dog yeah he's the only truly fictional dog in the book <laughs> okay all right that's awesome yeah. All right, so um, you know we already talked about some kind of big topics, and with middle grade fiction, um, there is a fine line between challenging your readers and you also want to protect them because they're kids. So, um, how did you balance that? And both can be true. Um, while I was writing this book, my kid was 11, um, so that's right about the center of the target market for the book, so um, it was pretty handy. I got to just really use my parental intuition in determining, like, what to put in and what to leave out. Um, so there's, you know, there's some fix of life that little kids can grasp, and there's, like, harder facts of life that high schoolers can grasp, and then for middle grades, they're kind of in the middle where they're on the verge of, like, starting to understand some pretty dark things about the world. Um, so... I really wanted to like balance humor with some of that stuff because if you just put all the darkness in is nobody's going to want to read that but if you make it light and funny and you're like mocking the important things then nobody's going to read that either so you've got to really like blend the two of them um so you know i chose to things show things like a dog getting euthanized because i think that's something that's age appropriate for middle graders to start to understand um, but then I pull back on stuff where, um, so Daniel does a lot of like really beating himself up for being super emotional and for feeling like he's, he's causing problems in his relationships because of all of that. So it was kind of tempting to like delve into how deeply he really beats himself up about that. But then, you know, it, would, it wouldn't necessarily serve a purpose in the book and it would probably just make readers feel bad. So I kind of pulled back on that where it was a little bit more 
told than shown how badly he's feeling about that stuff. So um, it can be a hard balance to get right, but having the walking, talking representative of my target market in my house while I was writing the book was very helpful. Hi. <laughs> That's my target. There, there they are. <laughs> I, I would agree, yes. Yeah, yeah. Having, having an 11 and a, now almost 17 year old is, um, yeah. but it's also humbling because, yeah. Hmm. If you get it wrong, they'll let you know, right? <laughs> oh, they certainly do. They're or very... you try, yeah, or you try too hard, or my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Right. Just how we learn, though, right? It's good. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll say that. So <laughs> <laughs> speaking of relationships between, you know, parents and kids and all that. So um, there are a lot of messages from parents uh, that Daniel and Ash are struggling with. So Ash's dad tells Ash uh that they need to uh accommodate others by picking a gender mm -hmm. ash's mom tells ash just be you out loud daniel's mom tells him that he needs to handle his emotions better and his dad tells him that life is just going to get more complicated so um why was it important for you to show how kids absorb and process these messages um i had two main audiences in mind while i wrote this book um one of them is parents, teachers, librarians, educators, um, and then the other one is the kids. So for the grown-up audience, I wanted to kind of um, provide a reminder that the messages that we send out to kids, including the messages we're not aware that we're sending out to kids, have a tremendous effect on them, even though you know they're at that age where they're starting to be like very stoic and like, I'm not gonna show you how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, whether those messages are positive or negative, it's really hitting home for these kids. So it's important that we, choose our actions and our words with care. Um, and then for the kid audience, I wanted to show that grownups aren't perfect. Um, we're doing the best we can, just like you. Uh, we don't all have it completely figured out. Um, and for the kids, like I wanted to show that, you know, if they feel safe to do so, it's okay to question messages from grownups that don't feel right and that don't seem like they're landing in the right way with you. Um, and to, you know, it, it can be scary when you're young and you're kind of you're not in a position of power and you're just kind of feeling like you're being told all these things at one time but you know if you if you are able to and you're able to do it safely then you should really question messages that don't feel right for you and try to initiate conversations like that so it's tough but hopefully some of the some of the stuff in the book will like provide a little bit of a window into how to do that in a way that doesn't wind up being you know explosive <laughs> yeah yeah well what was interesting you know as an adult reading it was i could tell that the adults were really they had good intentions like they weren't right. they were trying to help these kids who were struggling and they were really missing the mark sometimes like really mm -hmm. badly other times kind of kind of hitting the mark but still just not really and um you know, and i did like how they the ash and daniel were able to kind of course correct them a tiny bit i guess not you know nobody really has everybody learns we'll just put it that way but yeah it, it is hard as a parent to let a 13 year old course correct you yeah <laughs> you <know>? yeah <laughs> right but you know it, we have to we have to do it sometimes <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. oh my gosh um and so also with relationships in the book among um, friendships with with among the different kid characters a lot of them uh, have kind of gone sour in the beginning of the book um you know ash sorry daniel's relationship with his brother is always a little bit tense kind of up to the end um he's got real regrets about some things that happened with his former best friend ash had a relationship with a former friend camille and um I liked how you showed these relationships starting to improve, but it was slow, it was deliberate. There was a lot of real effort that had to go into that. Um, so what did you want readers to take away from that, the, the kid relationships? Um, the, the really the biggest message is that like mistakes are how we learn and yet it sucks to make mistakes and it especially sucks to admit when you've made a mistake, but like that's how life is we, we mess up and we learn um and if we are able to take a thoughtful and compassionate approach to righting our wrongs and we're willing to admit that we made a mistake um that's where you really open yourself up to growth and learning and light and love and you know i wanted to show the characters 
doing that, like realizing when they've screwed up. And then, you know, first you have to realize you screwed up and then you, you have to realize that you have to apologize and then you have to actually apologize. So it's like these three big emotional whammy things in a row. And then you got to hope that the apology lands, you know, cause sometimes it doesn't. Um, right. So I, I really wanted to show the kids like kind of stumbling through it, but attempting to do these things. And then like the benefit that comes when you actually can do that, so. And you, and you really kind of had them take responsibility for themselves. And especially with Daniel, I liked how, you know, he was kind of, he struggled with his big emotions, but he was able to take responsibility for how those affected his friendship with Cole. Yeah. And um, that was really cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was kind of tough to write. That it was a little tricky to write that, but I'm glad it came through. And you even have a tutorial on how to give an apology, <laughs> which many, many yeah. people should probably yeah, we can all use that. <laughs> yes, we all need that sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I just this this is an important book for kids, but it's also important for adults to read too. So parents, teachers, therapists, librarians, like what are you hoping that they'll take away from both can be true? Um, really kind of what I talked about before, where we have to be like very cognizant of the messages that we're sending out. Um, I think like some great some great things have happened recently where kids today are they're they're more able to connect with other kids who are experiencing some of the things they are particularly like kids who are going through like some gender variance issues where they're trying to figure out where they fit on the spectrum um you know 35 years ago when i was a kid like there were, you you couldn't talk to anybody about that stuff because you couldn't you couldn't just find an online community it's super easy to do that now um, so what that means, though, is that the kids are kind of like they're developing within their online spaces, their own like vernacular for how they talk about this. And they're they're developing like just new ways of experiencing it. And I think a lot of times, you know, like us old people, <laughs> parents and teachers and educators, um, we're kind of out of the loop. So um, it was great having a transgender 11 year old in my house as I wrote this because I could kind of quiz them about like, well, how do you talk about this? And how do you talk about that? And how do middle schoolers tend to think about this and process it? And, you know, particularly, what do you need from the adults in your life? So I kind of tried to put some of that in the book. So hopefully some of the messaging about like, you know, particularly Ash's mom, I kind of, she's kind of like the paragon of like how to have a transgender kid and not mess it up. So um, I hope that she kind of provides a role model to, to sort of, you know, how to be around kids who are experiencing these things that can be incredibly stressful and scary to talk to grownups about. So yeah, hopefully that that came through with her character. So yeah, for sure. She was great. I loved her a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so all right, let's kind of do some craft talk. So talk mm. about the evolution of your book. Like how did it start? How did it change along the way? I think it changed in some really awesome ways because like I said, I saw it early <laughs> on. Um, and then how did it get to be this, the final published book that we can now all get and enjoy today? So, um, it started out as a YA novel, which I believe is the draft that you read. Yes. Um, I wrote, I wrote like the first half of it. And then I had like a very detailed outline for the rest of it. And I was really excited about it. And I sent it to my agent and he was like, this is great. But I think what you've got here is a middle grade story trying to break out of its YA shell. And so, you know, I was like, oh god all that work now i gotta rewrite the whole thing and i was like you know it's a little resistant at first and then you know i i was kind of like watching my kid grow through this stuff where so in the ya market there's a lot of like fantastic books with trans characters and non-binary characters and it's 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 wonderful that we're starting to see like a proliferation of that available there um but that was too old for my kid and my kid's kind of going through this stuff and like looking around for age-appropriate media that addresses what they were going through they're not finding it and there was just there's not a lot in the middle grade space that addresses gender fluidity or transgenderness um so just kind of seeing my kid go through that along with this like message from my agent who knows the market really well kind of like came together and i was like you know what yes this absolutely is going to be a middle grade book so i kind of scrapped it um the characters are the same but the external plot is completely different i started over just rewrote the entire thing um and it, it just that's kind of where it where it where it came to be it just evolved from you know this one idea and became very different and and now it's out in the world so i guess it worked <laughs> right exactly yeah, yeah that, there's always that fun feeling when you when when you love something as a it's so humbling as a 
an author, you you think I always think about that. Uh, have you seen that TV show? Nailed it. it was, it's a comedy thing where it's a baking yeah. show. Yeah, my kid watched it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, you know, like they'll the 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 they'll finish their whatever and they'll go nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's awful, and they really did nail it. And like I've had the experience so much, like turning into my agent, like or my yep. editor, or something that I'm like nailed it and then I, <laughs> and like, no. and then I, I get a 20 page editorial letter back like yep, yep. <laughs> didn't <Right>. nail it <laughs> bling is a good word for it <laughs> so anyway but but it you know when you do find the right kind of flow and this and you find the story then it did you find that that it was not easy I don't think it's easy but did it did it come naturally then to get it as a middle yeah, grade and get was, it where um, this was actually the first middle grade book I ever tried to write so I had a lot of like doubts going into it that I was going to be able to do it because like everything I'd written up to that point had been either literary fiction or YA so I was like I have no idea what I'm doing so I asked my agent like give me a list of books that you think would like help me learn how to write middle grade and he totally came through he gave me this fantastic list I read all of them and I was like I think I can do this so yeah. and then again like having an 11 year old in my house while I was writing it hugely helpful for that so did they um, did they read any of your drafts yeah 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 wow. it was, it was very helpful. I was like you know I'd have a scene I was like you know kids talking in the cafeteria and I'd hand it over to my kid and he would be like yeah, th th this piece is just not working and then be like this piece is really funny though and like the the other great thing is that like they say a lot of funny stuff my kid is hilarious so I yeah. was like can I steal what you say and put it in my book <laughs> and he was like sure so there's a lot of like random stuff in my book that just came right out of my kid's mouth it just wound up in there so <laughs> that that is huge because i'm yeah. not sure i could get mine to well maybe my younger one i'm not sure about my older one if she would if she'd be willing but yeah <laughs> maybe someday maybe someday <laughs> yeah um also uh the book has your artwork in it which is that was a great surprise yeah. of flipping pages enjoying it and all of a sudden you, your drawings were there so talk about yeah. that that was fun um so ash in the book has a form of synesthesia which is basically where two of your senses get combined so you might like see sounds or uh, there's a book called like the man who tasted shapes or you know a lot of it's just like your senses get linked up so um for ash they they see sounds in their mind when they hear the sounds and so i have that kind of synesthesia as well so um like the sounds that i see like every sound i hear has a, a corresponding shape in my mind and i can't like decouple that and take it apart it's just it's the same thing so to me it's super weird that other people like don't see sounds so i'm like is there like a hole in your brain <laughs> so, um, so the sounds that I see are very like three dimensional and colorful and totally outside of my ability to draw them. So I kind of like with Ash, I was like, I'm going to have Ash draw sort of little cartoon representations of what those sounds look like. So, um, you know, when I started doodling them as I was like writing the book, I was like, oh, they're they're probably not going to want to put this in. So I, I, I sent it off to my agent and my editor I'm like, yeah, this is cool. We should totally put this in. So that was a, that was a great surprise. So I was just kind of like doodling like the shape of one of my dogs eating her Nyla bone, it makes this like very specific sound. So I was like, I'm gonna draw that and put it in the book. And I did, it was, it was cool. So, and there's like, there's a, a scene that's um, temporally appropriate where Ash is out in the woods hearing a cicada and like draws the way like the cicada scream, <laughs> basically the cicada scream looks. And so um, Ash also tries to make it more fun by adding like little stick figures to the drawings, how they're kind of like interacting on the picture. So just to give it like a funnier element that I think would appeal to middle graders more. So that was that was really fun. I was super glad that they were willing to include my sketches. So thanks, Harper Collins. Good job. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't. I mean, I, I don't think I'm spoiling anything, but I think you had told me that you want to include more art in some of your future books like yes, that's something next one actually it's got a ton of art in it so if we like get oh, to the okay, end and cool. start talking about that book I'll, yeah I'll yeah that. so yeah awesome okay i could yeah that's great um so what scene was your favorite to write in both can be true um so the scene that i that i really enjoyed writing the most was um uh, daniel goes through most of the book with this sort of like cloud hanging over his head you know he's a little bit charlie brownish like a lot of bad things have happened and he's really sad and he's like struggling with trying to save this dog that he's in love with that he thinks is gonna die so you know at the end when there's like that glimmer of hope 
and the clouds kind of part for him that was that was like so great to write so he's you know he he kind of like has this sudden realization like i'm hungry <laughs> you know he <laughs> hasn't realized that he hasn't really been hungry and he winds up eating this like horrible rubbery cold piece of pizza with olives on it but it's like the greatest thing he's ever eaten yeah he's finally feeling hope again so that was that was probably the funnest scene to write Oh yeah, that's sweet because the lady Papa John's took yep, the Papa pity John. on him. <laughs> <laughs> he looked really sad. You want this this terrible pizza that no one wanted? He was like, yeah. I, I would want to be the lady from Papa John's. Right, to give yeah. this poor child a slice of pizza. <laughs> oh yep. <yeah. laughs> oh my gosh. So and, and then what was the hardest scene to write? Uh, that would that would definitely be the scene where um, Ash goes to lunch with their dad, and he's um, you know he's he's coming from this place where he wants Ash's life to be easier, mm -hmm. but Ash is you know Ash varies between genders, and the dad is giving Ash this this message that you know you need to pick one and stick with it because it's going to make your life a lot easier. And Ash is kind of like, but that's not who I am, and it's really hard to fake the other gender when I'm you know when I'm one gender I can't fake the other one it's terrible <laughs> and the dad's right. just, just not hearing that at all um and you know ash just kind of he just kind of like get, he just pounds his message into ash over and over and they just kind of like shrink in the booth while they're like sitting across from him eating and i'm just like my heart's breaking for this poor kid but also it's like you know i needed to include the scene to kind of show like what those societal messages do to kids who are gender fluid or who are trans or whatever like it's it's so incredibly painful and dehumanizing and awful, even if it's coming from a grown up who might, you know, love you and want your life to be easier. It's it, like that's the wrong message to give those kids. You can't just say squash who you are so that your life is easier. That will not make your life easier. Newsflash. <laughs> so right, right. It was, was hard to write. It was it was tough. I felt so bad for the character at that point. Yeah, it was tough yeah. to read too because I could really feel. I could really feel that Ash was struggling. And I also, I didn't so much feel for the dad because like, yeah, clear, clearly <laughs> the dad was off base, but he was, he was <laughs> coming, coming from a place where maybe you get it, but it, yeah, that, that was a rough scene, um, but a good one. Yeah. And then, so anyway, you teased it, but now is it, can you tell us anything about your next book? Like, yeah, what I, it, I think, um, I haven't like announced it yet, but I'm probably going to be doing that pretty soon. It's it's through like the developmental edit stage and it's going to be moving into copy editing soon. So I assume that's going to be soon that I can like talk about, you know, official stuff. Um, so it's about two girls who um, their their school runs an active shooter drill that's like super realistic and they don't tell the kids ahead of time that it's a drill. So it winds up being this like incredibly traumatizing experience for everyone. So um the second book is it's a dual narrative or dual pov narrative like both can be true we've got you know <clears throat> the narrative goes back and forth between two characters um so one of the main characters has hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome which is something i have so it's it's interesting to like be able to like write about this health problem i've had for my entire life and you know the guise of this 13 year old who's going through a lot of it um and like her kind of take after this this active shooter drill that traumatizes them is like she wants to get revenge. So then the other girl, um, she's she's like a lot more quiet. She's she's the artist. Um, so like her section is actually illustrated, which I'm so excited about. She's like a spirograph nut, and I'm all about spirograph. I love spirograph. So it's been really cool to like incorporate spirograph designs into like her art about the drill and like she experiences a lot of anxiety and so she'll like pile the pieces of spirograph together to make this kind of like dark art that shows what she feels and I'm, I'm super excited about the book and about being able to show a lot of the cool art stuff that I've been working on so that's very exciting. So. Yay! Have they given you any indication of when it's going to be out? Uh, summer, summer of 22. So just okay. about a year from now. Yeah. All right. All right. So we have that to look forward to. So that's great. So all I can say is, you know, if you're watching, both can be true. Such a wonderful book by Jules. Jules is a great friend, a great writer. Thank and you so yeah. much for doing this with me. It's it's amazing. And I want to I want to talk about your book too, which is incredible. Um, Sarah has this wonderful book called Now and When. I don't know if that's backwards. Is that backwards? Uh, yeah, you should totally buy this book, everyone. It's great. It's about this girl who comes across a website that shows her everything she does not want to know about her future, including the fact that she is paired up with her complete nemesis, right? You know, at the current time of her life. Um, <laughs> 
and it's really interesting because it talks about like she tries to do all of these things to like affect the future and to like make it the future that she wants by manipulating the present and then that just does not go how she wants it to go at all and um i think it's really fantastic because it does a great job of showing how um like high school kids are really um, encouraged often to just focus very much on the future at the expense of paying attention to the experience that they're having now. It feels mm -hmm. like, you know, when you're in high school, like everything you're doing is in preparation for your future. It's like all these grades you're working hard to get so you can get into a good college and like you need to get, you know, um, like volunteer experience and work experience on your, you know, college applications and everything. And that's, it, it makes it really hard to just focus on having fun, which you should be doing as True. a teacher. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, I think it, it does a fantastic job of, of playing that tension out and kind of showing, you know, towards the end of the book, these characters starting to realize that they need to pay more attention to their now than, you know, what their future might be like and how everything that they're doing right now might affect that later. So it's yeah. fantastic. I, I love it. I, I, I read, you know, I like read lots of drafts of it with Sarah um, when we were trading our work back and forth and I've seen the evolution of it and it's I'm so I, I'm in love with how it turned out. It's a wonderful oh. book. Thank you. Yeah, that that was one of those uh, books that, you know, I, I turned it in and then and I, we we heard, oh, we uh, they love it. They they want it completely redone. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> we love it. Change everything. <laughs> yeah, but they but they were right. There were there were a lot of things that you know that went into the book that kind of subconsciously. I think we talked about how um, you know so much of ourselves will go in, and sometimes that maybe we're not even quite aware of it. Yes. And so I, I was going through some rough times in my life, and the original book was so dark in in its way. And uh, I just remember when I got my editorial letter, there uh, note after note was like, "Why are they crying here? Like, <laughs> what? What?" <laughs> I'm just and uh, just having the opportunity to kind of make it this kind of lighter. It's kind of a. It's not really a rom com, but um, it has some of those elements. Um, yeah, it's it, so it, it did a lot. It just did a lot to kind of you know get me into a better place. So I'm glad it's in the world. Um, me, too. me too. I'm so glad it's in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, so there's a giveaway, right? If we can yes. go to your uh, Instagram, they yep. can uh, enter to win your book yep. and, and my book. And when does that end? Um, I have that up through midnight tonight. So get on it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't have much. To yeah. Pass, so yeah, the Instagram is um, it's just Jules dot Machias, or maybe it's Jules dash Machias. I think it's dot. <laughs> okay. Jules Machias in there should show up. <laughs> okay. Well, you have a few more hours. You can uh, enter to win a copy of both yep. of our books. Yep. And if you don't win it, you should go buy Jules's book. <laughs> and <Amazing. Sarah. laughs> and line. Okay. Well, I mean, so let's see. Um, so we have a lot of viewers, some great comments. And Jules, you've been wonderful. I I, I might I know that you maybe sometimes you didn't don't want to talk too much. I know you get like headaches and stuff. So I'll maybe just let you go. And um, yeah, yeah. unless there's anything else you want to chat about. I think we pretty much covered all the important stuff. Um, I'm so grateful to you for doing this with me. It's it's just wonderful. It's I couldn't have asked for a better partner to do this QA with. So thank you Aww. again so, so much. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you for asking me. And just thanks for writing the book. And I can't wait to read the next one. All right. Same for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, everybody. It's Ann Patchett and Sparky. Thank you so much for joining us for this terrific event. Now we need you to do one more thing, which is buy the book from Parnassus Books. It's the way you can support authors and support your local independent bookstore. Because if we don't make money off these events, we can't keep doing them. And then there'll be no dog biscuits for Sparky. Shop local. Thanks so much.